just um, like for everyone to open their Bibles or with devices or whatever. <coughs> uh, Colossians, just a reading from Colossians chapter 1, verse, commencing at verse 15. So Colossians chapter 1, it's up on the screen as well, commencing at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead. So, then ev- so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So that'll be the reading that uh, Ryan will be speaking on this morning. Well, hello again, everyone. Andrew's just doing some technical adjustments. All good? Let me encourage everyone to grab their Bibles or their devices, whatever you use Sunday by Sunday, and open back up to Colossians chapter 1. And of course, let me add my word of welcome, uh, particularly if you're new or visiting with us. Um, it's great to have you along, but for our regulars here, it is great that week by week we can gather together on this, the Lord's Day, as His people. And in case you've forgotten or in case you weren't here last week, a quick reminder that we've begun a three-part series on Colossians chapter 1. A little bit of an introduction series for myself and for FPC as we come together, looking at some convictions about church, who the church is and what we should be doing. Today we'll be considering our Lord Jesus and simply marveling at His splendor and His glory as we are His people. And next week, as we continue on, we'll be looking at the role of the pastor as it's presented in Colossians. And last week, we saw that Paul and Timothy wrote to a healthy church. The people of Colossae were strong in faith and hope and love, those hallmarks of Christianity. And Paul and Timothy wrote to encourage them in their pursuit of Christ, to spur them on in their love and in their good deeds. And they wrote to encourage this church to cling to the true gospel, that whatever may come from the world, that whatever may seek to find its way into the church's thinking and teaching, that they were to remain standing firm on the true gospel. And of course, we were encouraged to do likewise. We saw that in Colossians 2, Paul will warn this church that falsehood is trying to creep in and that the remedy is to remain in Christ day by day, that the church must be maturing disciples for God's glory, for His pleasure and for His purpose, and that Paul and Timothy prayed that for the church a prayer that we echoed for our own church here at FBC, that God would fill us with knowledge of His will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, that we may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. We were reminded of 
who we, the church, are as a result of what Christ has done. And if you glance back just to those few verses there in verses 9 through 12, you'll see that Paul's prayer for the future of Colossae was anticipating what God was going to do amongst them. And this anticipation of the future is based on the past. Paul looks to what God is going to do by reflecting on what God has already done. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul looks at what is certain and secure and past as he prays for what is yet to happen in their life. But Paul can pray confidently and expectantly, knowing that God will bring about these good purposes, knowing that God will continue to do his work as they stand in faith. Paul understands that what Christ has begun in this church, he will carry on to completion. And we see that same mindset when he writes to the Philippians. You may be familiar with the verses where Paul prays for the church at Philippi. In Philippians 1, he says, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Essentially, in these prayers and in many of Paul's prayers throughout the other letters to the churches, we see that he looks to God's faithfulness in the past as security for what is going to happen in the future. He encourages churches to look back as they also look forward. Because God is faithful, because God is true to his word, and because God will fulfill the promises that he made, we can trust, churches can trust that his end purposes will be met, that what God has said he will do will be achieved. And in Colossians, amidst this consideration of God's goodness, of what God is going to do, as he stirs the church to focus once more on the centrality of the gospel, Paul bursts out into this word of praise. The verses that Murray read earlier for us, some people indeed believe are a song, praising Christ and praising God for his goodness in Christ. But it's here as Paul looks to what God has done, as he anticipates what God is going to do, that he bursts out in this praise. And he does the same thing that he encourages the Colossians to do. With a focus on the person and the work of Jesus, Paul looks back at what has already happened. He looks around at what is presently happening. And he looks forward to what God is going to do in Christ we see this pattern regularly in Scripture, not always using those words, looking backwards, looking around and looking forwards. But we see that God is the same today and yesterday and tomorrow. We see that he is the one who was and is and is to come. Time and time again, we see this pattern that God remains consistent, whether we're looking backward, forward, or around at what is happening, and that we can be confident as Christians because He is unchanging and His plans will come to fulfillment. And here in the book of Colossians, we have that same lens used. And we're going to use that this morning as a guide through this section of Scripture, this great praise of Christ. We're going to look back, we're going to look around, and then we're going to look forward. And those subheadings are on your sermon notes in the bulletin if you'd like to use them. Let's start by looking back. In your Bibles, we're into Colossians 1, verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. 
He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. See here, brothers and sisters, that the scriptures would have us marvel at the glorious nature of Jesus, the one who is before all things. Paul starts his consideration by looking not at what Jesus has done, but at who Jesus is by his very nature. He says, the Son is the image of the invisible God. Now, when we hear the idea that someone is made in the image of God or that someone bears the image of God, we may be tempted to think of Adam and Eve being created in the image of God, bearing some of the hallmarks of who he is. We may think of ourselves being made in the image of God, having an innate value because we are God's own creation. But what Paul is saying here is something slightly different. In a way, Christ is uniquely made in God's image because he is not made. He is by his very nature, God. Just as an only son is in one way the image of his father, Jesus, says Paul, is God of the same substance as the father and, of course, the Holy Spirit. He has always and will always be God simply by his nature. In Philippians 2.6, Paul urges the church to consider Christ to being in very nature God. He knows that Jesus has always been God. He was not made. He is eternally God, co-equal with the Father and the Spirit. In John 1.1, 1, 1, we have the same idea. In the beginning was the Word, that is Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Christ is a unique image bearer of God the Father. Christ makes visible what has previously been invisible. We pick up that same idea when the author of the Hebrews begins his letter. Writing in Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. This is who Jesus is, says Paul. First and foremost... He is God. God, who has been called Father throughout the whole of the Scriptures, has in Christ been made known. Jesus is God eternal from before the world began. Now remember the context of Paul's writing. He is writing to encourage the church to remain in Christ, to stand firm on the one in whom they have placed their faith, and he reminds them here, this is who you follow. This is whom you trust. This is where your hope is anchored. When challenges arise, when other worldly philosophy tries to sneak into the church, when teaching would lead you astray, remember who you follow. Jesus, not just a teacher, not just a man, not just the head of the church but the one who by his very nature is the eternal, everlasting, glorious God of all. That is who we see when we look back at Christ. And still looking back, Paul considers not only the nature of Jesus as God, but what he has done. He is the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Now, when the scriptures speak of Christ as the firstborn, 
here in Colossians. It is not saying that Christ has been born of God as if he were made or created after the Father. We've just been reminded that he is co-eternal with God the Father. He was there in the beginning. Rather, what it is alluding to is the status of a firstborn son. At the time of our scriptures writing, it was understood that the firstborn son took primacy in a family. He was the one who would be the heir and the new leader of the family should the father pass away or become unable to lead. And so it is that Christ is the heir and Lord of all creation. It is speaking of his function, not of him being somehow made. Christ is the firstborn in that he is the heir and Lord of all creation. Why? Because he made it. Paul continues to say that in his power and through him, everything was made. Back in John 1, we have that very same idea. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. He is the one responsible for all of creation. He is the one by which all of creation is sustained. Without the original work of Christ, nothing would exist. Without the continuing work of Christ, nothing would be sustained. Think about that. Your home, your pets, your loved ones, the rain, the sun, the ground under your feet, all here only because of Christ in the past and Christ in the present. The very air filling your lungs right now, there only by the grace and power of Jesus. Testimony to his enduring goodness to his creation. And a reminder that so often our view of Jesus can be far too small. That we can be far too easily tempted to slip into a trap of seeing Christ in too small a way. Sure, we still see him as glorious, as our saviour, as our Lord. But perhaps we slip into seeing him as just another man. Perhaps we think of him merely as a friend or a leader. Perhaps we only see the Jesus of the Gospels and we forget the fuller picture. Paul, looking back into eternity and to the beginning of creation, reminds us of who Christ truly is so that our faith might be strengthened and so that we might live a life pleasing to God. And there in verse 17, notice the very subtle shift as he moves from looking back to looking around. He is before all things, that's looking back, and in him all things hold together. Paul shifts from past to present, from looking back to looking around, and then he continues on. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Notice the shift to the present tense language. He is, he has things that have been done and are being done. Christ is the head of the church and just as the head of a person governs and rules its body, so Christ governs and rules the church. Now we thought deeply about the church last week, and here we're reminded that the church, that the actions of us at FBC must always align with our head. We may be right in saying that FBC is our church, in that we belong to this people. But the church does not belong to us. It has and always will belong to Jesus. 
when he purchased it with his blood, when he made a way for us to be brothers and sisters in his name, when he saved us who have repented and come to follow him as Lord and Saviour. Look how Paul stresses this point. Christ is the firstborn from the dead. Or the first fruits, your scriptures might read, from the dead. It's not saying that he is the first to have been raised to life. We know that he raised others miraculously. But rather that he is the first who has been raised in his own power, giving victory over death. In his redemptive work of dying sacrificially on the cross, paving the way for others like you and I. Christ is the first who conquered the grave so that we too might know conquering of the grave, a resurrected life in the future. We read that Christ brought reconciliation through the shedding of his blood. And that's why the church belongs to him. That's why we are his to govern and his to rule. And so as we look around at what Christ is presently doing, we see the task to which we are called to participate, the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation, quite simply put, is the bringing back together that which has been separated or broken. We see it in our own lives when we have a broken relationship and we come back together. That's reconciliation. Speaking of the cross, Paul, of course, is pointing us to see that sinners who have repented and turned to Christ in faith are forgiven through the power of his sacrifice. And what has been broken by our sin is restored by Christ and reconciled. So too he points to the expansive nature of Christ's work, that he is reconciling all things, whether on earth or in heaven. It's Paul's way of saying people everywhere, but also pointing beyond us to creation. The creation which Christ established, which has been corrupted by our sin. Will, it will one day be reconciled fully, restored to its good and very good status that we saw in Genesis 1 and 2. By overcoming the corrupting power of sin, Christ is doing this work now and will do it ultimately fully in the future. And so it's unsurprising, brothers and sisters, that reconciliation is one of the key tasks the church has as we seek to serve God. If you've got your Bibles, please flick across to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Again, a letter of our New Testament written by the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading at verse 16, where we see this same idea of the ministry of reconciliation. And again, we'll see that Paul is looking around at the world presently. He says, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who has no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Speaking there again of the power of the gospel in turning sinners like us into the righteous ones of God. As we look to our head, that is Christ, we see the task we have, the ministry of reconciliation. And what does that ministry look like? Well, Paul says it looks like being an ambassador 
for Christ. That is, that you are a representative of Christ and a message bearer of Christ. Just as looking back at who Jesus truly is, who we truly follow, reminds us of the confidence that we have in our salvation. So looking around at what Jesus is doing reminds us of what we should be doing of who we truly are. We are the ambassadors of Jesus in this world. And our task is the ministry of reconciliation, taking the gospel to those who are still in broken relationship and having it restored through the power of Christ. Like a foreign diplomat, you in this world represent Jesus. When you speak, you represent the King. When you act, you represent your king. Everything we say and do that is seen by those of the world is a reflection on whom we serve, on whom we represent. Would that viewpoint modify anything that you're doing in your life presently? If we realized that day by day and moment by moment, we are Christ's ambassadors in this world, Is there a temptation that would suddenly become less tempting? Is there a subtle drift away from Christ that would suddenly be turned back to him? Is there a way of acting or speaking that might be modified when we realize that we are representing our head, our Lord Jesus, in all we say and do? By being reminded that in our present circumstance, Christ is our head, the one who purchased us with his own blood, the one who you represent in word and deed. When we're reminded that it is the Lord we're presently serving, is there anything that would change? And it's this point of reconciliation on which Paul now pivots. Back in Colossians 1, he shifts from looking at what Christ is doing in his church and has done in his followers. And he looks forward to what Christ is yet to do. We're back in Colossians 1, picking up at verse 21. He says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Last week we saw that as part of God's present plan for the reconciled, that is, his church, we are to live a holy life, A life worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in every way. But the future plan, the climax of this fruitfulness, this holiness, is us being presented before God, holy, set apart, and blemish-free, guilty, free from the guilt of sin, free from the shame of anything we've done in this life. As Ephesians 5 says, Christ will present her, that is the church, as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, holy and blameless. That is the future for those who are in Christ now. For those reconciled sinners who now by grace continue in their faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. That is what awaits, being presented before the Father, holy, righteous, sin-free, blemish-free. What an encouragement to stand firm in Christ, that is. What a great encouragement and hope it is for those who are in some way doubting or being lured by worldly teaching. To be reminded of what is coming for the faithful so that we might now live as those faithful ones. It's a helpful tool for us, I think, to practice these skills regularly, to look back at who Christ is and what he has done, to look around at what he is presently doing, 
and to look forward to the hope that we have in the future. Let me try and bring this to some sort of practical application in your life. If you get nothing out of this sermon other than to marvel at what Christ has done and who he is, that's okay. But let me suggest that there are more things we can glean from this great passage. Firstly, if things are going well in your life as a follower of Christ, if you're putting off sin, if you're putting on righteousness, if time with God is easy and rewarding and rich, if prayer and Bible reading is coming fruitfully in your life, look back and see that it's only through Christ's goodness. Praise Him. Celebrate. Press on. See that here and now in these good times, He is producing fruit in your life and anticipate the glorious time when you will be presented before God. And with that hope fixed in your mind, with that joy of what Christ is doing in you, join in that ministry of reconciliation. Remind yourself again how great the gospel is so that you might be there to share it with the world that so desperately needs it. Go to the evangelism seminar next week. Read a book on evangelism. Speak to a friend who is a good evangelist. Or better yet, just give it a go. Share this great and glorious news with a friend, a co-worker, a family member. Tell someone this week about this magnificent Jesus and what he has done. If you're in a good place, use this season, use this time for God's glory. Or maybe here today you find yourself in a season of doubt. You're a bit downcast in life. Maybe you're bombarded by other ways of thinking, struggling with the truth claims of the gospel, tempted to drift into worldly thinking. Consider what Christ has done to bring you to himself. You were created by him. You've been sustained by him, purchased by him, reconciled to him. Grace upon grace upon grace in your life to bring you to the point of following Christ. His claim on your life is unique. And look at what he's doing now. Even if you're struggling this morning, you are here amongst brothers and sisters who would love to help you and encourage you. You're here listening to the word that is urging you to come back to Christ and follow him. That you might be strengthened in your hope and in your trust. If you're in that season of doubt, look forward to what he has promised his faithful ones. See how great the reward is for those who remain in Christ. Refocus. Press on. Share those burdens with us. Share with a trusted brother or sister here. We need to help one another along this journey. Well, maybe you're here this morning and you aren't following Christ at all. Maybe you're uncertain as to whether Jesus could possibly want you. Maybe you think, I'm mad. And that your sin is too great for Jesus to forgive. That your brokenness is too broken for him to reconcile. Well then, friend, look at what Christ has done. Look around. He has saved this wretched lot and me. Far more like us around the world. That is what Jesus does. He has done it through the shedding of his own blood on the cross. And there is no sin which that cannot cover. Look forward. We will all stand before God one day, either as sinners guilty in our shame and in our disgrace, to be judged by a holy God, or we will be presented pure, holy, righteous, blameless, if we have come to follow Christ. If that is you and you're wrestling with this today, My encouragement is to speak to someone who you know follows Christ. Come and speak to me or someone else here. We'd be delighted to share more of this good news with you.
to try and answer your questions and to pray with you and encourage you. Perhaps even to begin the journey of following Jesus with us. Friends, whatever circumstance we find ourselves in today and into the future, there is always great value in remembering that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Keeping our eyes on the glory of Jesus, let me encourage us to regularly look back, look around, and to look forward. Would you pray with me that we might be that sort of people? Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we have paused in this your day to consider your word and to marvel at the glory of Jesus, we thank you that in your goodness and in your word you have revealed him to us, that by your spirit we can learn more about him, that we can know him and follow him. We thank you that in eternity past, Christ has always been. That in creation, he has been active, forming this world and everything in it. That by his power, it is all sustained. And we thank you that he has been made known to us. That he took on flesh and dwelt among us. That through his sacrificial death, and through his mighty resurrection, he has brought about the ministry of reconciliation. That we who were born in sin, who have by faith come to Christ, can know that now we are forgiven and called to tell others this great news. And we thank you too, Father, that we can look forward to that day where in Christ we can have every confidence that we will be brought before you holy and pure and without stain or blemish, not because of anything we have done, but because of Christ's goodness to us. And as we look back, as we look at what Jesus is doing now and as we anticipate this great and wonderful future, we pray that you would use all of those thoughts to strengthen our faith now to encourage us in the ministry of reconciliation and the sharing of the gospel now. For those who are in a season of doubt and struggle, we ask that these great truths that we have considered would bring them back to Christ with a new and fresh vigor. Lord, we ask that in your goodness we might all find ourselves in times of joy as we follow Jesus. May that pursuit of him be rewarding, deepening, strengthening. We ask that you would use us well in your service as your ambassadors. We pray it all in Jesus' name that he might be glorified. Amen. Well, friends, having considered...